Hello and welcome to uh, chapter 13 lecture video on monopolistic competition and oligopoly. So what we're going to talk about today are the two types of markets that are in the middle of the continuum or, or not the extremes. Like so far we've talked about pure competition and pure monopoly. Those are the exceptions, not the rule, right? So those are the extremes on both ends. Uh, we've talked about both of them and now we're going to talk about uh, the types of market structures that mostly prevail in uh, in economies like the United States economy or in most of the world, right? So we're going to talk about those things today. We're going to start off with monopolistic competition. So, and just to recap, when we when we start out with each one, we're just going to recap kind of what it is, right? That we're talking about. So this is the what it is page. So the monopolistic competition has relatively large number of sellers. So that's kind of like our pure competition, right? A lot of sellers that are in the market. But one of the differences is is, is this right here, right? So they do have product differentiation. So this is different than pure competition, in that uh, competitors actually. Uh, they actually compete, right? They actually differentiate their product. Say, hey, we do this better. We change this about our product. This is our service. Uh, they, they advertise and market those kind of things, right? So this is kind of product differentiation. There's, there's also, like, like the competition we talked about before, is uh, purely competitive markets have easy entry and exit. For the, so for the most part, it's relatively easy. There's not a lot of uh, barriers to entry. And then, um, like I said before, with the, the differentiation, there's also non-prize competition. So a lot of branding, advertising, things that uh, help maybe wet the consumer's taste a little bit for a certain uh, shoe, right? Like a Nike over another shoe, maybe something else, right? That doesn't have quite the brand or the advertising behind it. So, uh, for for firm concentration ratios, right, uh, are a measure of industry concentration. Okay, so this is this is this is a for firm concentration ratio ratio. So uh, they're a, they're a measure of the concentration. So we take the four biggest firm and the percentage of the sales of the four largest firms in an industry. Right is basically what we're doing about the concentration. So if those firms have most of the market, then uh, that ratio is going to be uh, pretty high, right? So the output of the four largest firms is going to be up here. Let's say, for example, I don't know. Let's say it's like eight hundred thousand uh, dollars, right? And then a uh, total output of the interest industry, let's say it's a million dollars, right? So it's going to be basically 80% of the market or the four largest firms. So that, that means that's a really concentrated, not necessarily a super competitive market. Um, so, so anyways, so th typically the more competitive markets are going to be the percentage, four largest firm percentages are going to be 40% and uh, below, right? That's pretty competitive for the most part. Okay, so that we have another kind of measurement here. It's called the Herfindahl Index. Okay, and the way that that is done is it's, there's, it's basically the sum of squared market shares. So we take all the market shares for all of the firms within an industry, we square their market share, and then we add them all up. So the biggest, like for example, if there's if it was a pure monopoly, the pure monopoly Herfindahl index is uh, ten thousand. Okay, so that's basically a hundred uh, percent, right, squared. Okay, so that's one end of the Herfindahl index. The other end of the Herfindahl index is going to be uh, zero, right? Basically, or or like point. 0, 0, 0, 0001 or, or even less, right? So where basically all of the market participants have just a little sliver of the market share. And it's going to be a, a mixture in between all these things. So here's here's some examples. Okay. So some of the uh, more competitive 
Markets are going to be the, uh, the markets for, let's say, for retail bakeries or quick printing, right? Down here on this end are going to be more competitive. The, the less or have less competition are going to be up here towards this end, the textile machinery, women's dresses, those type of things. Okay, so the, the firm's uh, demand curve is highly but not perfectly elastic when we're doing monopolistic competition. So it's pretty elastic, uh, closer to being perfectly horizontal, but not really, right? It is more elastic than the monopoly's demand curve uh, because the seller has many rivals producing close substitutes. So in, a, in many cases, so the price, the price range that's available is a lot less because there's a lot of substitutes out there, right? So that's why the demand curve is, is not quite as steep as the monopoly okay so the short run so in the short run monopolistic competition still produces where marginal revenue equals marginal cost in the long run there's just a normal profit right kind of like our perfect competition so that's really when there's any kind of competition in the marketplace really and competition is uh, valued and it's sometimes protected by government right and we have the ability to enter and exit then in the long run there's going to be a normal profit so it's going to eat away any extra profit that may be earned above and beyond kind of like what the economy how the economy is performing in the current um, in the current trend okay so this is what it looks like, right? So this is the demand curve, um, not perfectly elastic, right? Yet not as not as uh, curved as like say the monopoly, right? So this is kind of like maybe a mon what the monopoly would look like is a demand curve, something maybe a little steeper. And then the, the perfect competition uh, is gonna be something like this. So this is our uh, monopolistic competition kind of a mixture that's kind of where the it gets its name right it's the mixture between okay so the firms produce where quantity is where the marginal revenue equals marginal cost okay and it kind of like the monopoly we 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 then map up to the demand curve to find our price and then really the the trick is then is finding where price we compare price to our average variable cost or average total cost and then we're able to find whether we're making a profit or whether we should operate or whether we are may are losing maybe we're minimizing a loss so this is the loss minimization this is what it looks like so when average total cost is above the price that is currently being charged where marginal revenue equals marginal cost Okay. In the long run, this is what it looks like, right? So average total cost just nuzzles right up to the demand curve, right where the price is, and that is in the long run where uh, monopolistic competition, competitive industries uh, operate. But they're always trying to drive up profits, right? They're always trying to get more market share, and, and they're trying to differentiate themselves in the short run, right? In the short run, to boost those profits. So there's a little give and take, right? This is not necessarily uh, a static thing. It's very dynamic, all right? So and the, the productive efficiency, right, means that the firm is producing in the least costly way and is found uh, where price equals minimum average total cost. And allocative, where, where we allocate our resources, allocative efficiency means that the firm is producing the right amount of product and is found where price equals marginal cost. So neither of these conditions is met in monopolistic competition. So they're, in a, they're basically in a situation where they're inefficient. So there's so much flux and there's, and there's competition that, that really they never really reach that efficient point in pure competition because they can differentiate is really the trick, right? Okay, so it's gonna, it's gonna look something like this, right? So 
So that would be perfectly efficient, but then we're still giving up this little piece right here of the, whether it's the um, producer surplus uh, or the consumer surplus, right? And so we're not able to really uh, be super efficient either with how we produce or what, how much we produce. So one thing that's found in uh, monopolistic competition is the firm is constantly managing price, product, and advertising, right? So they're always trying to differentiate differentiate from competitors. They're trying to get the, the, the best advertising because advertising really does pay off in the end. And then the consumer benefits, so the, the producer is always trying to get that extra bit of profit. That's where they benefit. The consumer benefits by a greater array of choices and better products because in the competitive scheme of things, they're always trying to improve and differentiate in a good way to entice consumers to buy. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna slide over to an oligopoly. Okay, so we're going from a lot of producers. Now we're going to not so many producers, a few large producers. So that may be maybe a thousand producers down to a hundred or ten producers, or maybe. 10,000 producers down to something closer to, you know, a thousand or a hundred. So it just depends. It's relative, right? When an oligopoly, oligopoly is considered. So it's all relative. It's all a continuum. Um, so they have, for the most part, uh, so there are two types of oligopolies. One is a, a homogeneous, uh, right? Or standardized oligopoly, like the steel or aluminum markets, right? There are also differentiated oligopolies like markets for automobiles, electronics, and equipment. So it really depends on the product that they're making. So standardized uh, or homogeneous oligopolies typically are ones that are found in the uh, making products that are more like commodities, right? Like oil or steel or aluminum, those type of things. Differentiated oligopolies are those that are making similar type products, yet they definitely have different brands and, and there's enough differentiation uh, there that, that, uh, that consumers can have a little taste involved, right? Um, so there's also, on an oligopoly, the oligopolist or the producers in an oligopoly have a, a limited control over price. That is, unless they collude, and we'll talk about that differently. There's also some entry barriers. There's going to be maybe a high capital requirement or there's going to be regulations or other things involved with getting in or out of an oligopoly. Um, that tends to create oligopolies. It's just having those entry barriers in there. And within oligopolies, there's some mergers that often happen or they try to happen. Depends on which country you're in or what regulations are happening. You know, if, if for example... I think it's uh, Verizon that's trying to buy out Yahoo. Now, that'll probably happen, but when uh, a, a larger company tried to buy out, like Comcast, for example, it didn't work because it was going to reduce the competition. And that's the main thing in the US is they really try to uh, help competition remain in the marketplace instead of being more monopolistic. Okay, so. Um, kind of like I said before, right? The firm for firm concentration ratio, 40% or more is considered an oligopoly, right? So oligopolies definitely uh, have their shortcomings. Uh, there's, there, you know, there's maybe a lot less uh, selection because of oligopolies. They also have a tendency to collude. And so we'll talk about that a little bit, which is uh, in some countries frowned upon definitely, in most countries. Uh, there's oligopolies could be in the form of localized market. It doesn't necessarily have to be international. It could be a localized oligopoly. Um, and so there could also be some, within oligopolies, there could be inter-industry competition, right? Depends on how the, the companies are built and what kind of competition they have. In the international scheme, there's import competition as well. But definitely... There, for the most part, for oligopolies, to have an oligopoly, there are some dominant firms in the marketplace. So here's kind of what the oligopolies look like. Uh, 
So the, the ones we saw before were mostly competitive market type uh, industries. Now we see up here with, with all of these, these are basically almost on the verge of being monopolies, okay? Uh, all of these would be considered oligopolies. So one of the main things with oligopolies is when you have a few competitors, then you know who you are competing with, you know what their products are specifically, um, and you form a strategy, right? So you try to figure out, okay, what are they going to do with their product? What are they going to do with their price? Am I going to match? Am I going to, am I going to ignore them? Uh, and it forms a bit of a mutual interdependence on the industry just because uh, sometimes it's good to have a strong competitor in the oligopoly or a partner um, because a rising tide raises all boats, right? So everybody that's competing, if the market and the economy works out, then everybody gets uh, their fair share of the pie. Um, there's also a, a temptation anyways to collude. So this is definitely illegal in the United States. And what that means is basically that they work together on setting the price. So they become a monopoly. Um, so collusion um, is definitely, I guess, the uh, temptation there. Incentive to cheat in many ways. Whether that's to cheat together or to, to cheat by um, beating out a competitor, it may be, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell what is cheating, what's not cheating sometimes in business, right? We're gonna talk about game theory here uh, by the end in the prisoner's dilemma. This is kind of connected together as well. So this is the game theory. The game theory uh, states this, right? So the, the graph is, is a payoff matrix. So this is an example of game theory. For a two firm oligopoly, so there's only two firms in this industry, it is used to show the payoff to each firm that would result from each combination of strategies. Each firm has two possible pricing strategies, low or high, right? So uh, rare air strategy, so there's gonna be two competitors, and here's our competitors. Rare air is pricing strategy, okay? Are shown in the top margin, and uptowns is in the left margin. Okay, they can either have a high price strategy or a low price strategy. Each, la each letter cell of this four cell payoff matrix represents one combination of a rare error and an uptown strategy and shows the profit that a combination would earn for each. Okay, so that's how it lays out here. So here's our combinations. So what is the best thing for uh, uptown. Well, the best thing for uptown is right here, right? They get the if they do a, a a high price and rare air does a low price, then they get the better end of the deal. Same thing for rare air. If they do high and and uh, uptown goes low, then they get the better end of the deal. So uh, the question is, is what's best for both, right? Right here. Right, for both of them to go high or both of them to go low. So who's who's gonna do what? So what has the greatest combined profit? Right? Assuming no collusion, right? The outcome of this game is cell D. Cell D. Why would it be sell D? Well, it's the safest bet, right? With both parties using low price strategies and earning eight million in profits, however, this inferior profit level would eventually lead firms to higher prices, okay? So they're doing low, low high. So, so that's really the combination that is the winner. Why, well, the, the reason is, is because, so so if, if, the, if each does low, right so this is really the win for each on both sides and then we we go across here and we say okay what would be the best win well the best would be for both to go low instead of high okay and eventually it would it would go to higher uh higher rates or higher prices i should say
Okay, so here's so that's the game theory. The game theory um, is is laid out to say, okay, what is the best strategy, right? And that helps um, helps us understand what uh, might be the best combined strategy between two opponents. Now there's three oligopoly models that we're going to talk about. So these are the these are the three models right here. So this is kink demand curves one. Uh, collusive pricing is another model, and then price leadership is the third, right? So there's three models because there's so many different types of industries, uh, different types of oligopolies, right? Different types of maybe uh, depending on what industry, what people are making, what the mixture is, who's the leading firm, uh, and and all of the, all of those different things go into it. How many competitors there really are in the market. So and there and there's such a complication for all this interdependence that really we need three models to really understand uh, how it all comes together. So the first one is that kink demand theory. This one is based on uncertainty of rivals' reactions, right? So you can't collude with this model. And so what ends up happening is this is the strategy at the end at the bottom here. So we're going to match all price reductions. So if a, if, if, a uh, <clears throat> if a competitor reduces their price, we're going to match it. If they uh, do a price increase, we're going to ignore. Okay. So that's the strategy, and this is kind of the graph and how it looks. And this is why it's called the kink demand curve. Okay. Is because uh, at the point where the prices rise and we ignore it, right? So it's going to kink our curve. So it's going to look like this, right? At this point, right, with the demand curve going this way and prices going higher, we are ignoring this part of the competitor's actions and strategy. Our strategy is as soon as they go up, we're going to ignore it. We're going to keep ours pretty much the same. If they go down, we're going to follow them down. So that's why the acceleration goes down. There and that's why it's called the kink demand curve, anyways. For that, okay. And and it also has in in this sense uh, a, a, a connected mar a marginal revenue and marginal cost curves that are connected in this way. So we kind of have a gap. Basically, it it picks up, right? It's kind of a gap here, anyways. In, in the nature or the, um, the behavior of our margins in that case. So, so it does explain why people, why there's inf inflexibility in the market, right? So because they're being, when prices go up, they ignore it, right? So they're not flexible on upward pricing, just downward pricing necessarily. Um, and so a lot of times this leads to, or this theory kind of explains what, how, we, how price wars come about. Because as soon as prices start dropping, then in order to protect market share, uh, a lot of times companies will match falling prices. So now we're gonna talk about collusions, okay? Collusions for the most part are mapped out just like monopolies because when uh, partners collude, or people car cartels, right? Like OPEC, for example, it, with oil, when they get together and they set prices and set production levels, okay, those are connected together. The quantity and price are inextricably connected. Production levels are the prices, okay, in the end. And so when that when that is set, then basically they become a monopoly, and the and the rules for the monopoly that we talked about last. Uh, chapter or last video uh, hold true okay so uh, it says here so the cartel is defined as a group of firms or nations joining together and formally agreeing as to the price uh, they will charge in the output levels each of each member right so it is illegal in the US to for businesses um, to form uh, these type of cartels or have this type of collusion and, and businesses can have huge damages uh, from lawsuits and get in big trouble if they do collude. So this is kind of, or at least this is how OPEC 
looks. It, and in recent years, this is really kind of broken up, especially with the, um, the new oil being produced in uh, North America and uh, South America. It's kind of broken up some of these cartels and their ability to really control pricing with oil. So, um, so anyways, there, and here's some obstacles, just things, uh, obstacles to collusion, right? Um, and so uh, here's the third model. The third model uh, tends to be the one that, that a lot of US firms uh, take, and that is price leader, the price leadership model. So where you have a price leader in your industry, and what happens is that they set the price, and then everyone else will follow, right? So, um, so one result is infrequent price changes since the leader is never certain that the other firms will follow. So if they do increase the price, then, then it has to be uh, more certain than not that others will follow and increase their price as well or else the leader will lose its market share and not be the leader anymore in many cases. So that kinked demand curve still falls into place even with price leadership. So, uh, so advertising tends to be quite active when we have uh, oligopolies as well, right? So in differentiated oligopolies, so this is not necessarily the uh, homogeneous monopolies, but differentiated ones like cars, right, for example. Advertising is the best way to communicate a firm's product differences. Okay, and so the product improvements reveal, uh, revealed through the advertising can be successful in increasing market share and revenues because product innovations are more difficult to copy by a competitor than a price change. Okay, so the demand curve or the, the kink demand curve is really just price changes with the same goods. But if you have a new product with better uh, better like say a car for example with a new computer system that's even better right or Wi-Fi in the car all that all that stuff then you're able to charge higher price premium price not necessarily com directly competitive competing because you have a different product so I'm gonna go ahead and stop right now and um, and I'll do I'm gonna be doing some of the uh, assignment video for this chapter as well for uh, for this week and I'll I'll throw it out for you to um, look at as well so thanks and have a good day bye